under Bidenomics, we've already had over $490 billion in private investment commitments. I think the numbers make the case for Bidenomics. Uh, I'm happy to come out here and talk about them, but these are these are facts. So, you know, of course, we've had 13.2 million jobs since this president got here. And yes, we've seen some cooling in the job market, and that's necessary and important if we're going to appropriately align labor supply and demand. Hello and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Heather Long, an economic columnist and member of the Post editorial board. Today we have a very special guest, President Biden's longtime economic advisor, Jared Bernstein. He was also recently confirmed as the new chair of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. Welcome to Post Live, Chair Bernstein. <laughs> Uh, it's great to be with you. Uh, you and I know each other w for a while, so uh, you're welcome to call me Jared, and I'll call you Heather, if that's okay. All right, that works for me. I was going to say, is it chair, chairman, just Jared? Um, so we all saw really great numbers last week on the inflation, very encouraging story with inflation cooling off. Tell us, are you ready to declare victory on inflation? So uh, I don't know if you can hear me, but this isn't working. I'm sorry to say I'm not hearing you, uh, which is very discouraging. Oh, no. Let me try it again. Uh, can you hear us now or not I yet? I can, but you were going in and out, but try again. All right. One more time. Um, if you like, I, I, could, uh, I could jump in a car and get over there. Uh, I know. Here. We probably should have done it in person. You're a few blocks <laughs> away from me, but uh, we can try again. Um, but yes, I, right. I definitely... Looking forward to talking to you, but uh, seems like we have a bit of a shaky connection. So why don't you try again? All right, let me try one more time. I'm wondering, can we declare victory yet on inflation after those good numbers last week? No victory laps, no mission accomplished, no declarations of that sort uh, uh, at, at, uh, would be appropriate. Um, we are definitely making uh, real substantive progress in terms of providing households with more breathing room. Uh, inflation is down not just in a monthly blip sense, but on a yearly basis, 12 months in a row, down two thirds. So if we were talking a year ago, uh, we would have been talking about 9% inflation. Now we're talking about 3%. Uh, we've seen uh, some real easing of prices in terms of goods, uh, things that you know, buy in, uh, uh, in retail uh, outlets, uh, we've seen prices actually come down, not just slower inflation, but lower prices in some uh, uh, parts of groceries. Uh, obviously, gas is about a buck fifty uh, less than it was a year ago. So real progress, real breathing room, but more work to do. And I think one of the important attributes of Bidenomics is that we have a lot more savings in the pipeline in this regard. Yeah, can you say a little bit more about that? I'm wondering, I know many your team has great models to try to figure out how all of this dynamics play together. You've been tweeting some really interesting data around housing and rent, for instance. Um, can we get mm. to 2% to this magic 2% inflation target by the end of the year or early next year? How optimistic are you? Well, I think it's actually pretty tricky to fork <laughs> to say to state the obvious. Uh, forecasting inflation has been a, a very uh, tough ordeal. Uh, we still are in a post-pandemic uh, economy. 
uh, lots of uncertainties out there. I mean, one thing that uh, you and I have been talking economics for a long time, I don't think either of us have ever seen um, macroeconomic di dynamics of the following type. Six percentage points lower inflation, that's the two thirds decline in inflation, with unemployment staying below 4% for 17 months in a row. As you know, uh, go back to the last time inflation went up this high and fell, uh, uh, eventually fell down, which was you know, probably about 40 years ago, so, so around the 1980s or so, early 80s, uh, the unemployment rate had to just about double. I think it went from about 6% to about 11% when inflation came down this way. So we've gotten a lot of inflation reduction without much sacrifice uh, on the job market, uh, particularly on the unemployment rate, but even in terms of job numbers. I mean, as your uh, intro suggested, um, the pace of job growth has been slowing, but it's still very solid. Um, so that tells you you're into some uh, unusual or uncharted areas. So I'm, I'm hesitant to forecast. What I can tell you is that we have real momentum. Uh, this is not a monthly change. This is 12 months in a row of slower inflation. And the second part of your question, uh, there are significant cost savings in the pipeline when it comes to Bidenomics on prescription drugs, on clean energy, and on broad expanding the economy's capacity when it comes to microchips uh, as well as infrastructure. Yeah, that's really interesting. <laughs> I've certainly heard a lot of praise in this inflation cooling environment for the Federal Reserve. Obviously, they took very bold actions. Um, but what's the case here? How much credit does President Biden deserve for bringing inflation down from 9.1 to 3 percent in, in the past year? Well, it kind of relates to the comments I made a minute ago. When you have inflation coming down as far as it has, and you really haven't seen too much sacrifice on the demand side, that is unemployment has stayed very low, historically low, extremely important from the perspective of Bidenomics. You know, pillar two of Bidenomics is empowering workers. And one of the ways we do that is maintaining a very tight labor market. So that's really important to us. When you see that happening, um, you can pretty fairly conclude that there's a lot of positive action taking place on the economy supply side. You know, uh, and, and actions that we've taken there include, of course, uh, releasing uh, the historically uh, the largest uh, number of barrels of oil from the strategic reserves. I'm going back to, you know, over a year ago. So I'm saying that that, that was something that helped um, uh, back then. Um, uh, but uh, starting in, in mid-2021, President Biden stood up the uh, Supply Chain Disruption Task Force, we worked very closely with uh, private sector allies in the ports in Long Beach and Los Angeles. We had an envoy out there working on this and we helped, helped. This is not all of our credit by a long shot. We worked closely with the private sector. Uh, we helped to unsnarl supply chains. And if you actually look at some of the indices of where supply chains are at, the New York Federal Reserve has one. Uh, there are others that we've written about on the CEA website, you can see in our blogs. You will see two things. You will see that supply chains are largely back to where they were in terms of their functionality pre-pandemic. And you will also see that core goods prices have moved along with those supply chains and have improved uh, as, the, as, the, as the chains have unsnarled. So I would say our fingerprints are on some of those supply side actions. Now, look, the president has consistently said the Fed is the first and foremost inflation fighter. So I want to be clear, we're not taking uh, you know, any of that credit away from them. They've, they've obviously worked uh, 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 they've done a bunch in this space, uh, but on, uh, that, that's, that tends to be more on the demand side of the economy. And thus far, I think what we've uh, seen from inflation has been some real supply side improvements and some, and some demand deceleration. That's in the mix as well. Yeah. Speaking of that demand deceleration, I'm wondering if you could be a little reflective. Uh, what we often hear from critics of the White House is that the American Rescue Plan, the $1.5 trillion that was passed shortly after the president took office was too big and that that really fueled demand and really fueled a lot of the inflation problems. In hindsight, was it a little too big? I don't think so. I mean, I think if you consider uh, the things that we've been talking about thus far, we can't divorce them or separate them uh, from the, uh, the rescue plan. I think the rescue plan set up 
the historic job market recovery we're talking about. So I think it's wrong to say, look at this great job market and forget that one of the things the president explicitly talked about, it was one of his first economic speeches, was getting back to full employment as quickly as possible because he knows that that helps give workers the bargaining power that they would otherwise lack, especially middle and low wage workers, uh, to get ahead, to get their fair slice of the pie. And, you know, bottom up, middle out growth, uh, key uh, goal of Bidenomics very much relates to this issue of workers having the bargaining clout to get uh, a fair shake. Now, we have a very pro-union president, and that helps but we've also had a very tight job market. And I think you'd be somewhat hard pressed to find an economist who, who wouldn't honestly connect, you know, who, who, who uh, you know, an honest sort of uh, even critics of, of our program who wouldn't um, agree that the, uh, that, the, that the growth that we've enjoyed, that the, the really quick return to the full employment labor market uh, was very much helped by, by the rescue plan. Now, when you talk about the inflation part of the equation, I think it's fair to say that the inflation that took off in spring of 21 was a function of strong demand plus constrained supply. Now, some people will add expectations to that calculation, but they've been pretty anchored, so we don't have to go there so much. So if you think of strong demand and constrained supply helping to really set off uh, the inflation uh, that, uh, that took off back then, um, and, and you look at where we are now, 12 uh, months of, uh, of improvements, um, you can pretty much unwind that calculation and think that uh, we've benefited from, as I've mentioned, uh, the unsnarling of supply chains, but also some dampening on the demand side as well. Part of that is fiscal retraction. Uh, part of that is the work of the Fed. Part of that is consumers kind of burning through some of their excess savings. But I think that's the right way to think of uh, where we were and where we are. Mm. So riddle me this. I know you get this question a good bit. Why don't Americans give this economy a better grade? You've seen the polling, you know, it's like only one in three approve of the president's handling of the economy. Why do you think it's so gloomy? Well, I think there are a few things. Uh, we're starting to see some improvement in the sentiment indexes. You know, the UMIS index uh, really popped up up uh, in its last report. One month, I don't want to over torque on one month. I understand uh, what you're asking about, Heather, and uh, uh, it's something you know I've looked at pretty closely. I think Americans have been through um, a whole lot over the past couple of years. I mean, a 100-year pandemic, um, the horrible uh, illegal invasion of the sovereign nation of Ukraine, the supply chain snarl-ups we've talked about, of course, you know, inflation at, uh, a, a year ago at a, at a 40 year high, two thirds of that has, has come off, which obviously is you know, very positive. Um, but ha having gone through all of that, uh, I think people have been definitely somewhat shaken up by, by, by what they've been through. And I think what the president did when he got here was to say, we have to get back to normal as quickly as possible. It may take a while for that, uh, uh, kind of um, renormalization to work into people's consciousness, but we're starting to see some of it now. I happen to think that a key part of that ingredient is real wage gains. That is, wages rising faster than inflation. And we're now seeing that, but uh, that's that's a relatively new trend. Uh, it's the last few months we've seen wages start to beat inflation. And as that's occurred, we've started to see some improvements in these indexes. So that's the answer one. People have been through a lot. It takes a while for things to normalize. And I think uh, as uh, they continue to do so, people will hopefully feel better. But here's another thing. Part of the problem is what folks are asking people about. If you want to understand how people feel about Bidenomics, you should probably ask them about the granular components therein. And if you do so, you get quite different answers. And in fact, something like the Inf Inflation Reduction Act, the Infrastructure Law, the CHIPS Act, they poll way north of 50 percent. I think some of them poll north of 70 percent. It kind of comes down to this. I mean, if you go to Flint, Michigan, and you ask people, what do you think about replacing lead pipes with pipes that don't poison your kids? Mm -hmm. 
you're going to get a you're going to get a, a very high approval rating and that at a granular level is what we're doing now when you ask people about the broad macro economy sometimes they divorce that from their own financial situation which has actually improved in some ways in in recent uh, months especially as inflation has come down so i i, I think it's a, i think there are a lot of moving parts there but i think one answer is to really drill down and ask people about the more granular impacts of what we're trying to do yeah, those specific policies. I've got a exactly. bunch of questions on Bidenomic specifics for you, but I want to make sure to get some in here. You and I have always talked about workers. I mean, it's one of the reasons you've long worked with, with President Biden, because of that concern you both share about workers and about unions. Um, tell me how you assess the current situation. The How much power do workers have in the current economy? Is it enough? Is it too much? What would you say? Uh, I would say that workers in the current economy have significant bargaining clout that they would not have uh, if the unemployment rate were uh, uh, higher than it is. The fact that it's been, uh, we've been at something sort of approaching full employment, I think people can quibble about some of those numbers, but we've been we've been in, a, in an area where essentially employers have had to bid up uh, wage offers, uh, employees uh, to get and keep the workers they need, where workers can upgrade their job and say, um, yeah, this job isn't the quality I'm looking for, I'm going to get a better one. That just doesn't happen in an economy with a lot of slack. And again, if you go back to early speeches by President Biden and of course, when he was vice president, we worked together. This is an insight that he has long had. So I think um, the tight job market is is helping a lot in that regard. By the way, Chair Powell has said very similar. Say this is a well understood phenomenon. Um, I think the uh, one way you're one way you're beginning to see that is, is that as inflation has come down. Real wages, they've slowed somewhat as the job market has softened. Uh, I heard in a clip that you played early for me that you know, labor demand and supply becoming a little better aligned. That has a lot to do with the improvement in the supply side of the economy. Another benefit, by the way, of tight labor markets is you pull more people in from the sidelines. And we have working age labor participation rates that are hitting historical highs, especially for women, and are a 20-year high overall. Put all of that together, and you have a situation where workers are getting a larger slice of the pie. And another way to talk about that in almost you know, very straightforward terms is to point out real wage gains. Over the past year, wages are up 1.2% for private workers. They're up 1.6% for middle wage workers. So they're up more for people at the middle and the bottom than they are for people at the top. Uh, and that is, um, a, I think, a good sign that the correct answer to your question is yes, uh, workers, particularly middle and lower wage workers, have more bargaining clout, and that's helpful. And talk to me about the strikes. Uh, President Biden came out very powerfully on Friday in endorsing the Hollywood uh, actors and, and writers strikes. Um, but a big one on many people's minds is what happens if the UPS workers, over 300,000, would go on strike at the end of the month? Is that something the White House would be supportive of? I think one of the best things we can do at the White House when you're in a position like that and uh, the, uh, the companies and the unions are starting to talk to each other is stay the heck out of their way. Uh, and so that's what I intend to do. I will say that, of course, when you have a, uh, a president as, as, as understanding of the importance of unions and their role in bargaining clout, you know, if you're building the economy from the middle out and the bottom up, worker bargaining, bargaining power is an essential ingredient. And of course, Unions play a key role there, which is why Joe Biden has always been supportive of it. So uh, that, that's very much in our consciousness. But uh, I, I'm not it, it would not be at all helpful for me to comment on uh, negotiations that in some cases aren't even underway yet. Yes, we're all hoping for a good resolution. Um, so Bidenomics, you've said a lot about it. The president said a lot about it in recent weeks. But tell me this in 10 years, what are people going to remember? about Bidenomics? Well, if they think back uh, and if things go as planned, uh, they will remember that the uh, transformational shift in domestic production of clean energy products, of electric vehicles, of batteries, uh, uh, dates back to uh, investments that um, we're talking about today. Um, 
the magnitude, I think, I, again, you played this in your, in, in your introduction, the magnitude of investments, if you look at the construction of manufacturing facilities uh, for, uh, again, for microprocessors and for uh, clean energy products, electric vehicles, electric batteries, solar, wind, uh, those industries are uh, standing up as we speak. Now, these are early days, so your question about 10 years is, is, is a good one and an interesting one. But I think historians will look back and, uh, and, and reflect on really what is, again, I keep talking about these pillars, pillar one of Bidenomics, which is that public investment can pull in private investment. Uh, this stands in direct contrast to trickle down. So I think historians will look back and uh, you know, recognize that uh, the rejection of top down trickle down economics based on just decades of empirical evidence that it doesn't work was replaced by a very different set of ideas. In the, the idea on trickle down is if the, if the public sector stops investing, if it just you know, disinvests in our, in our public infrastructure, the private sector will come in and make up the difference. Joe Biden knows that that's always been wrong and that in fact, it's backwards. That the way to um, uh, crowd in private investment is to make the public investment in areas that are, are underinvested, where the market itself will underinvest. It underinvests certainly in domestic semiconductor production. It underinvests in uh, clean energy. Um, it even underinvests in you know empowering and educating workers. And you know, left to its own devices, we 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 can see the uh, evolution of anti-competitiveness that Bidenomics also strikes out against. So I think what you'd see looking 10 years, you know, if you, if you went 10 years hence and looked back, I think what you'd see is an economic model that tapped the power of private production by paving the way through public investment, through public, uh, through, through worker empowerment and through worker, or through worker education and through promoting competition so small businesses, entrepreneurs can have a real fair chance to get into the mix. Mm -hmm. So help me think through this. This is where I struggle a little bit with Bidenomics is, you know, what you're painting is a big transformation for the country on the energy front and on the industrial base front. Um, you know, it's probably create a good bit number of jobs. But I'm sorry, Heather, really... could you start that question again? Because I didn't hear you when you started. We had a yeah, sure. Out. I apologize for these uh, connection problems. We, we clearly need some investments in this infrastructure. <laughs> broadband, yeah. we're, we're focusing on rural broadband, but we need some urban broadband in this case. <laughs> All of the above. Um, yeah. Okay, so Bidenomics, here's where I'm struggling a little bit. There's obviously sure. a lot of investment going on in energy sector, in the manufacturing sector, uh, but a lot of this seems like incentives for companies. Uh, it's investments to help spur private sector growth. Um, how does that really feed through to, to the middle class? How are individuals and households really going to see that? Well, it's, uh, it's businesses that create employment uh, and it's middle class uh, households that create economic activity for businesses. So it is a virtuous cycle. When we say middle out growth, we're talking about consumers who uh, have healthy economic conditions, um, making the kinds of purchases uh, and investments that stimulate the private sector to keep this virtuous flywheel going. And one of the things that happens when we uh, fail to sufficiently invest in public infrastructure is that we don't um, crowd in enough private investment uh, so that the consumer, the middle class consumer, doesn't have the buying clout, doesn't have the labor market, doesn't have the jobs to uh, get that growth cycle going. So it's really a, you know, a very kind of, uh, in some level, sort of simple, but another level, pretty profound um, virtuous cycle. Uh, you know, when we say middle out growth, that's not just a catchphrase. It's actually an architecture for um, uh, um, ongoing, not not. I was going to say stimulus, not stimulating, but stimulus kind of implies a uh, you know a specific intervention against an economic chop. 
that, you know, a healthy middle class is a recipe for consistent demand triggering um, economic activity, triggering investment, uh, and, 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 you know, the cycle, the, the, the more virtuous cycle is, is, is off and running. I think what, you know, we've made this very kind of fundamental mistake in basic economics, which is to think that somehow the top 1% all, you know, so much of the wealth is disproportionately going to the top, to think that the top 1% can do it. That's trickle down. That's, that's the failure of trickle down. The idea that as long as rich people have all the tax cuts and the, the wealth that they need, that will trickle down and lift the middle class. That's top down growth. And that has decades of, uh, of evidence uh, against its uh, effectiveness. Middle out growth, bottom out, bottom up growth, that is much more uh, I think, uh, a much more lasting proposition in the sense that I've just tried to communicate. All right, let me run a couple by you. I know you've heard some of these before. Um, a crit criticism comes on, um, there's so much investment happening at home, and are we really the best place to do all of this manufacturing? So let me ask it this way. Does President Biden believe in free trade? Uh, certainly, President Biden believes in uh, robust trade flows. I mean, I'm not sure what the word free trade means, to tell you the honest truth. I have seen free trade agreements that are 2,000 pages long, um, and they involve a lot of things that aren't free trade, like protecting pharmaceuticals. So I think we need to be careful what we mean when we throw those words around. I, I know that the president is, uh, you know, very much remains very uh, favorably disposed towards trade flows. Now, it is true that we have taken precautions uh, to ensure that those flows uh, uh, pass two very important uh, uh, tests for us. One is that they don't threaten our national security. So yes, we've taken uh, actions to uh, ensure that some of our uh, enemies or potential enemies uh, aren't able to weaponize uh, some uh, components of trade flows against us. And two, Resilience. So we have seen real non-resiliency of supply chains, and that very much caught the president's attention. So when you say, when, when one says we're for a, mo a more secure uh, uh, trade um, uh, relationships, and when we're for um, more resilient trade flows, we are not saying that uh, we're for some kind of autarky or zero trade or you know, shutting off uh, trade at the borders. Um, instead, we're talking about um, uh, much more nuanced differences, where we continue to benefit from the increased supply that global trade brings to the table, uh, but we take out some of the non-resiliencies that, that uh, in the supply chains that really hurt us uh, during uh, the, the pandemic. I think, frankly, if, if, if uh, for any, any economist or trade economist who didn't learn that lesson, you know, they weren't paying attention. Yeah. All right, let's get one or two more before we let you go. Um, I know you get this one a lot too. Uh, we're not um, in a recession not now. Oh, all right, let me try one more time. Uh, we are obviously not in a recession now, far from it. Uh, it what do you think? Are we going to avoid it for the next year? Well, um, the way you started is exactly the right place, which is to look at where we are right now. And, you know, as you well know, um, a recession is not you know, a matter of your vibes or what kind of mood you're in. And there's actually a set of, uh, of, 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 of very distinct indicators that um, uh, explain where the economy is in that regard. And they have to do with uh, personal income, with uh, payroll employment, uh, retail sales, and so on, industrial production. And so um, if you look where we are, as you said, you know, the, these indicators are, are, are certainly not flashing anything close to recession. Where we're going is uh, is a much tougher proposition. I said earlier when you asked me to forecast inflation, you know, it's just I think it's not uh, you know I think it's just a, a very uh, tough business to be in these days, given the uncertainty kind of embedded in this economy and some of the the unusual forces that we're seeing. Um, we've certainly been able to bring down inflation by a great deal, by two thirds, in fact, to be precise while not sacrificing much at all on the employment side. So that suggests momentum. And that's the sort of the best answer I can give to your question. Where we are right now looks, I think, very good in regards to any of these recession indicators. It looks very non-recessionary. Where we're going is partly a function 
of the um, of the momentum that we have. You know, when inflation is falling 12 months in a row, that's a trend. Uh, it's not a monthly blip. When you have an economy that's 70 percent consumer spending and you have a labor market that that's been characterized by unemployment below four percent for over a year and a half, that means you have a strong, robust consumer. And sure enough, um, uh, month in, month out, quarter in, quarter out, we've had you know, good consumption, uh, consumer spending results. I'm now seeing estimates, not our estimates, but estimates from the Atlanta Fed, from uh, various uh, market shops that look at, uh, that, that are estimating the, the growth in the second quarter, maybe somewhere in between one and a half and 2%. Again, that's not a White House estimate, that's a market estimate. And that's coming off growth, it was around 2% in the first quarter. You will remember, maybe you reported on this, a lot of people were talking recession in those quarters. And you know those great growth rates that I'm citing, they're clearly non-recessionary. So I think where we are is, uh, is, is uh, you know, a characteristic, uh, I think where we are is certainly, you know, clearly non-recessionary, and I think there's some momentum to keep us in that space. Well, the word of the day certainly seems to be momentum. As you say, let's hope it keeps going. Great to have you with us, Chair Bernstein. Uh, welcome anytime. Thanks so much. Thank you for joining us for a wide-ranging discussion on the economy today. There are more great discussions coming up. Check it out at WashingtonPostLive.com.